All right, welcome back to The Transfigured Life. And we have a special episode today. We are met with Father Jonathan, of course, and we have Father Alexi. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Father Alexi, you're, you're known to a lot of people. Um, but uh, one of the things I, I and we're going to get into why and how and all of that, but I want to just make sure that uh, people know that um, that there there are some things that we want to bring to our our uh, viewers attention. One of them is a book you've written called Wade in the River, the story of the African Christian faith, uh, which you wrote in 2001. Uh, and, and the review is very apropos. Wade in the River is a fresh approach to the faith of Africa and its contribution to the world, starting with the biblical accounts of significant Africans, then passing through early Christianity, winding through the Islamic period, pressing past Western slavery, and finally arriving at the present era. The book describes the riches of ancient African Christianity. This book fills an important gap in the need for people from all ethnic backgrounds, to rethink the idea that Christianity is a white man's religion. Now, we're going to get to that um, that idea of white man's religion in just a moment. But um, I, I want to first uh, ask you, Father Alexei, uh, people may be looking at the topic, uh, okay, African Christianity and the black American experience. All right. So they look at Luther and they go, okay, that's obvious. They look at me and they look at you. And they're going to say, what in the world do these guys have anything to say about African Christianity? So tell us a little bit about yourself, please. It's a fascinating life history that you have. Sure. Um, well, first, I, I would say that there's, a, there's an advantage of me telling the story being white. And that is the fact that um, a lot of white people don't hear it from a black person. And they do need to hear this story. So there's an there's an actual opportunity there for that. But the second thing is a lot of black people don't know about the riches that have come out of African Christianity historically. And so it's a both and situation. But it's a very good question. How how is it that I, a white guy, am telling this story? I know you didn't exactly say that, but it's sort of implied. And that is, um, I'll remind, I'll, I'll share with you a story. When I, shortly after I first met my future wife, who at the time was Thelma, later became Marishka Mikaela, uh, we were sitting one day at a um, pizza hut and um, with her daughter, Sherlyn. And so we were talking about our backgrounds. And I said, yeah, I have a, my grandfather was Jewish, and then she snaps her fingers and she goes, I knew he wasn't all white. And so the reason that she said that was because um, she herself was raised actually on a former plantation when she was a little girl down in Garland, Arkansas. And uh, there's, there's actual visceral memories that she had of picking cotton, the, the, her, her parents uh, would actually drag her along in a sack when she was a little baby while they were picking cotton. And um, this whole experience was very much part of her experience. After <clears throat> there was a, um, um, one of her brothers died, the family moved to Texarkana, Arkansas, and they grew up in an area that was a segregated black community that the white people called the dump. But for them, it was this actual black village right in the middle of Texarkana, where they had everything that they needed. They'd all share together. They would work together. Lots of wonderful stories. And so uh, she came to Kansas City around 1960, part of that northern migration that was happening, and ended up um, eventually we, we met in 1984 when uh, we were starting to, a couple of my friends, we were distributing food in this apartment building. And um, 
she, it was for elderly and handicapped people. She had very severe asthma and um, emphysema. And so she had actually been disabled as a result. And one day I was there and this little boy pulls on my jacket and he says, my grandma don't have no food. And so I said, okay, uh, let's go up. So we went up there and her daughter was there. And she said, you can put it right here in the refrigerator. So we put it, and she said, my mother's not here at the, this time. She'll be back soon. Her name was Thelma. So I went downstairs. At the time, I'd come from work, had a three-piece suit on, uh, short hair. And um, what ended up taking place was this lady that looked just like the, her daughter upstairs comes walking through the door with her other daughter. And I said, is your name Thelma? And she said, how do you know my name? And uh, she thought I was like FBI or something, you know? So I, I was like, um, oh, no, no, no. I, I, we were just, your your grandson told me to bring some food up. And she said, you put food in my refrigerator? And so um, what I found out that the reason that her refrigerator was empty was she would go out in the streets in the middle of the night, talk to these these people that were, some were homeless, some were like, like had just lost their way. And so she'd bring them into her apartment building, give them something to eat. And so um, it was the beginning of this amazing journey. Well, we got married in 86. Uh, we started together with some other friends, both from the Midtown area of Kansas City and from the suburbs, a group called Reconciliation Ministries. And so out of that, it, um, um, it was this really a ministry of pulling together, working together to feed the poor, to, to learn about ourselves. It was a powerful time. Well, in the middle of that one day, we were having a prayer meeting and uh, a noon meeting. And so this homeless man who'd been living under this bush in the Kansas City Life Insurance building, he, he kept coming into our noon prayer meetings. And after he was watching us, after about a month, he said, I see you guys like to pray. He said, I think you should read this book called The Way of a Pilgrim. And so um, that book became the turning point where we eventually ended up becoming Orthodox Christians because it was all about the Jesus prayer. Speaking of this rich history uh, wow. that you speak of, this the you know the African Christian tradition, how how black would you say the Bible is? <laughs> is it oh, you know we got? It's a very good know, question yeah. because um, we see th through the lens of our experience, but when you think back. And um, if you look at um, the Sephardic Jews, for instance, most of the Sephardic, we had some Sephardic Israelis living with us for a while. And uh, they were, uh, one was about your color, Luther. Uh, another was a little bit lighter skinned. And the reason I mention that is because the fact that you begin to understand, when you're talking about the, the people of Israel, the people of Egypt, and you you uh, have to realize this is a people that's from a, a, a multicolored, multicultured tapestry, and it was the the Bible was emerged from a people of color for all of the world, and so it was it was um, something that when you look back on that history. Uh, you realize, wait a minute, there's a lot more there than meets the eye. You know, there there was there was culture, there was skin color involved. It, it was one of the most interesting stories in the scripture was when Miriam and Aaron were trying to scold Moses for marrying an Ethiopian wife. And so how did how did they get judged? They they turned white. They had their their skin was leprous and they turned white and then Moses had to pray for them. And so here you begin to see right there the way that this this kind of attitude towards skin color was already being treated 
by the people of Israel. And then you think about Joseph marrying Asenath, who was from Egypt, and um, the two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, were the two sons from that marriage. And so um, there's a lot more there when you begin to really look at it that, that people have not really truly reflected on. That's just in the scriptures. Uh, another example would be like uh, Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene was part of Africa, part of Libya. Um, and then you have um, the, there's Lucius called Niger. He, he, he's black in Acts 13. And out of that group of prophets, they, they had been praying and, and fasting. It says ministering to the Lord. The Greek word is liturgizing. And as they were liturgizing, the Lord says, "Separate from me, Barnabas and Paul, to the work Barnabas and Saul to the work I've called them to." And so you begin to realize, ah, there's much more here that we have to unpack. And so then, the uh, it was a beautiful thing to see what took place in the scriptures because, and you know, we think about the Holy Land as where Christ went that he was in the Holy Land. But people don't think about the fact that part of the Holy Land was where the feet of Christ touched. Well, Mary and Joseph and Jesus went down into Africa to escape the oppression of Herod. And so mm -hmm. you have to begin to recognize that if we are thinking about Holy Land, we also have to include that as part of it as well. Father, let's say uh, uh, Luther asked a really interesting question, how black. I'm going to go in the other direction because there are some people, and I think this may have started with Malcolm X, that, that Christianity is a white man's religion. So mm -hmm. I, I think the question um, we want to then ask is um, uh, why, would, why would people who probably don't know the history that you're, you just talked about, why would they say that Christianity is a white man's religion? Where did that come from? It became, it? well, no, that's, that's a very good point. But when Malcolm X said that, it was because of a hybridization of Christianity that came through Europe. What, do I, mm -hmm. what am I referring to? I'm talking about it. this mm -hmm. this whole thing about um, slavery based on skin color was something that was foreign to the ancient world. There has been slavery from ancient times, but slavery based upon skin color specifically started to happen in the 1400s. And this was actually with the fall of Constantinople. In Constantinople, one of the biggest um, sources for, for trading slaves came out of the Balkans. And they would actually be taking people from Slavic countries to be to become their slaves. The word, very word "slave" is is rooted in the the word "slav," and it's that word means glory. But because they were taking a lot of slaves from the Slavic people, what ended up happening was that 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 became synonymous with that. But when the slave trade was cut off by the Muslim occupation under the Ottoman Turks, they had to look for another source. And then they began to totally go down into Africa and, you know, the rest of that story. Well, I say this because of the fact that what then happened was that they began to find out that it wasn't economically viable for them to have uh, slaves becoming Christians because part of it created this ethical dilemma with if if my Christian brother is a slave, how can I treat him as a Christian? I mean, how can I treat him as a slave any longer? How can I see him as property if he's baptized? I mean, and, I, and you begin to look at the whole thing. So they began to treat them with a whole other catechism. They would actually pull out sections of the scripture to basically brainwash slaves like um, slaves obey your masters and things like that. This would be part of the catechism that would be given to the slaves without explaining the rest of the context. But um, the if you if you look back 
not very far and you begin to look, all of a sudden you recognize, wait a minute, the most, some of the richest expressions of early Christianity from apostolic times were in Egypt, Ethiopia, Nubia, because those are the places that the apostles went. Matthew and, and went in, into Ethiopia. Mark went into Alexandria. Others like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 that's mentioned there, he was under what we call Queen Candace. But actually in Nubia, the Kandaka, which is where we got the word Candace from, was actually a title of the, the Nubian queens. And so the mm -hmm. finance minister that was from that region was also a practicing Jew. And so he went there every year as part of his duty, but he would come back and he was reading the prophets, prophets, prophecy of Isaiah. And for him to have a scroll meant that he was very, very wealthy because you, you know, most people at that time, not only uh, couldn't read, but they also didn't have the scroll. So here he was. And so it's this, very powerful image that starts to take place. And in that region, there was this flourishing of Christianity. Then with the time of the martyrs, there were many, many African martyrs. As a matter of fact, to this day, the church in Egypt, they regard 284 as the beginning of their calendar and they call it AM, Anno Martyrium, the year of the martyrs. Because in that year, Diocletian had killed one million African Christians because of their faith in Christ. And then right. you, you trace that all the way through. And it wasn't only martyrs in Africa, but the St. Maurice and the Theban Legion was a, was a, they, they had thousands of the African soldiers. They were from upper Egypt, which means it was further South. It's the, and then it was the lower Egypt is down by the Mediterranean Sea. And so they, they were soldiers that had been fighting for the Roman army, but then they required them to sacrifice to the idols, and they wouldn't. So throughout the Alps, Germany, Switzerland, northern Italy, <coughs> it's, it's um, all of these people that were part of the Theban Legion, 6,600 of them were martyred. So the whole blood of Central Europe is sanctified by the blood of these martyrs. It's just an amazing thing to think about. That's St. Maurice and the Theban Legion. But so they've given us early apostolic testimony. They've given us the experience with the early martyrs. But then you think about the teachers of the church, like St. Athanasius, St. Kirill of Alexandria, just those two alone. The, the impetus for the two creeds came in a large part from St. Athanasius. And then the, the, um, the, the defense of the, at the third council in the place of the mother of God was by St. Kirill of Alexandria. And then you think about in the West, you have another African father, Augustine, and um, who came from um, the area that today would have been Alexandria. But so, you begin to look at all of this, St. Cyprian of Carthage, there's, it's, it's loaded, you know, with that. <laughs> and then after the, that teaching, after the martyrdom period, of course, there was this flourishing that was actually one of the beautiful things that was said was that the desert has become a city. It was mm. in, from Egypt, that, in Ethiopia, I, I heard something that during the time of the early monks, the bell could be heard from one part of the Nile all the way down to Ethiopia because there were so many monks. And they, they wow. would just fill this entire area of people that were living um, this monastic life. St. Anthony of Egypt, St. Macarius, St. Pacomius. You know, I could go on and on. It's just, it's just the riches of Africa are something that's, that's so much that we need to share. And even the African spirituality, a lot of people don't realize the belief in the immortal soul, the, 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 the fact that there was the, um, they had this innate sense of goodness. There was this um, uh, recognition of, of ultimate judgment uh, and many, many other things that were part of African spirituality. 
even the idea of Isis and Horus in Egyptian mythology, when mm -hmm. after Jeremiah the prophet had come, that became uh, actually part of what they looked for was this virgin and child based upon what um, uh, Jeremiah had prophesied. And some of his prophecies were actually recorded by the ancient Egyptians. So St. Nikolai Velomirovich talked about that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Father, because actually the uh, in our last episode that Father Jonathan and I did, uh, I, you know, basically posted that on social media. And I had a guy, I don't, I don't know if you saw all this, Father Jonathan, some guy was like, hey, it's good that you're showing, you know, the mother of God, uh, you know, respect, like you're showing, you know, the Virgin Mary respect. But basically to sum it up, he was just like, hey, that stuff, we got to get back to African traditions. You know, he, he brought up Horus and other things. And sometimes it seems like they, they push away Christianity and try to uh, speak to some of that other stuff and say it's a lot older. Are you familiar with, uh, oh, yeah. you know, these kind of, what, what are your thoughts? This, on well, this wasn't anything new. This was actually one of the early Christian apologists, Justin Martyr. He actually talked about in cultures, there was this idea of the, um, um, the, the seed of the word present within cultures. And mm -hmm. so he would, he, and sometimes they talk about that, that as the pre evangelium, pre gospel. And you see, you already know, and like, Jewish culture, the prophecies about the Messiah coming. But mm -hmm. I was at a, um, a church in Romania and another church in Greece were actually outside the church. They had had Greek philosophers. Oh, yeah, I've seen those photos. Yeah. yeah. And it was fascinating. Without, the, they, without the halos. Yeah. We have without the halos, but they still acknowledged mm -hmm. them as being inspired because there was like this something that was longing for truth. And it began to mm -hmm. reflect in these other things. And so this is why in pre-Christian culture, when you begin to see these images and these allusions to something deeper, we shouldn't, as they say, throw out the baby with the bathwater. We should rather take a look and say, well, what were they really longing for here? Because mm -hmm. we we know that the um, that which was like a schoolmaster within the Jewish people of the law to lead them to the Messiah was also present in other cultures as they kept pressing forward and pressing forward until the actual coming of the Messiah himself. And there, there was the fulfillment of all of these things that everybody was longing for within these other cultures. So it's it's very important as, as um, it says, when you can extract the precious from the worthless, then you'll be my spokesman. And oh, we, when we look at the stories, the mythology, the histories that we all carry, we have to look at that and ask, what's consistent with what Jesus came to give us? What's inconsistent? And this right. was the model that actually St. Herman of Alaska used when he went into Alaska. And so right. he saw those things with the Native American culture that were already consistent, and he built on those things. And those wow. things, though, that were inconsistent, that were harmful, destructive, or leading people into death and dissolution, he would help them see how that was from the demonic realm. So those mm -hmm. are the kinds of things I think we have to stop and carefully look at. And then we can be able to, um, I think, find a way that we can be able to build on the good and, and be healed from the bad and the evil. Father, I'm I'm really really curious to to ask you something, and and um, because I think it's germane to to what we're talking about here, um, in current debates about the origins of Christianity and their ties to Africa, Africa is treated as as we would conceive of now as the entire continent. Africa is conceived in the entire continent. Back then, and I'm talking about 2,000 years ago, the concept of Africa, as I understand it, didn't exist like we understand today. There was Ethiopia, there was Egypt, there was Libya, there was you know whatever else. 
And I think Africa was a very small area of the northern coast of the continent, but it wasn't a word, and I could be wrong, that applied to the entire continent. Any any comment on that? And I have a reason for asking. I'll get to that. <clears throat> the actual word, this is the, the word Ethiopia, means literally the land of, of burnt skin people. And so they they would the darker that the skin color was they would refer to them as ethiopians this is why in some of the uh, translations of the um paradise of the holy fathers when you would read about um certain people that were from india and and they would use the same word for them it was because of the, many of the people from india having dark skin but it was um it wasn't a derogatory term, not only by early Christians, but it also wasn't a derogatory term by much of the society back then. They knew that it wasn't Roman, but there was still a lot of respect for it. Um, some of There's a great exhibit right now in uh, New York at the Met. Metropolitan it, Museum, Art, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, called... Africa and Byzantium. And one of the th things that it shows in there is this, this um, mutual influence, mutual influence of Africa on Byzantium and Byzantium on Africa. And when, when they, they would view, use that word Africa and, the, and that exhibit, they were talking about all of it. They, were, they weren't just talking about the, the, the regions like of North Africa. They were talking about the whole thing because they showed the influence of Nubia, which is modern day Sudan, the influence of Ethiopia, the um, collaboration that they had with the Byzantine Empire and the influence of faith in all of those regions. It was amazing. So a and lot of that. Even, even in Roman times back then, the second biggest and second most important city in all of the Roman Empire was Alexandria. Was That's Ethiopia. right. That's right. So one of the other fascinating things that you see in, in Roman art during that period of time was the, the many skin colors that were all the Roman citizens. So that you, and it was like, you know, it wasn't based upon this group being slave and this group being um, noblemen. It just would show all of them together. I mean, there's that's one of those these those early paintings um in in the met that that has it there so i think these are these are things that we have very much suffered from the um trauma collective trauma of these 500 years of slavery that's happened and and how it's caused our thinking to be so um uh, unhuman and so we yeah. we have to do some real work on being, being able to see ourselves from the original perspective that God created us in the first place. Yeah. Amen to that. It's good. Well said, Father. Mm. What, what would you say is some of that, that reworking? So, you know, obviously the history that we have here and specifically in the, in the United States, and I mean, there's, uh, we could say that it's been affected just more than the United States, but how do we work towards some of that healing? Like what is an Orthodox perspective on how we understand each other as, as people and um, just what's going on in today? Uh, one thing I think that would be helpful would be to, Father Moses Berry just recently passed on January 12th. He's, he's actually the one that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, brought us into the Orthodox Church, and um, he has a lot of wonderful little video clips on YouTube, and um, it would be good to take a look at some of those, because in his experience, he talks about that. The other, um, there's a lot of, if, we, if we're committed to this Orthodox idea of iconography, that, a, that an icon is a window of heaven, and an icon should be venerated, then we need to stop and think about the first icon. The first icon that was created was a human being. 
and man and woman were made in the image and likeness of God. And so if we stop and we think about veneration, and if we show respect for that icon of God in front of us, we have to realize, as Father Moses said, that there's a lot of flowers in God's garden. And they're mm. all worthy of veneration because of the common creator. Um, I'll never forget one That's time, great. one time my wife and I were at, at a dump in Hermosillo, Mexico. And we were with some friends distributing toy uh, shoes to these kids in the dump. And this one little uh, child comes up to my wife and licks his finger and then wipes it and then tastes my wife and says, why did God make you chocolate? And so <laughs> when we found out what it actually meant, we started cracking up and it's, a, it's just another variation. Like, you know, the Lord has a, has a lot of chocolate and he has a lot <laughs> of vanilla and he has a lot. In other words, we're all candies and to God we're sweet, but we've, mm -hmm. we've like, you know, tried to, make it one group against another rather than realizing the benefit of it. So I, wow. I think that we have to stop and realize, wait a minute, who who's behind this division? Mm. Who's behind this trying to polarize us all? I mean, and it's wow. it's interesting when you think about the the words for symbol and devil. Because you know the Greek word symbolos is which is like the symbol that's that which unites us, like the cross, the gospel, an icon. But the word diabolos literally means to scatter or to tear oh, apart or to, to break apart. And so when you think about the whisperer that gets behind the scene and starts to put in all of these innuendos trying to break everybody apart, then you realize, ah, oh, that's what's happening. And so, mm. you know, there's, there's true unity in Christ. There's this Amen. true unity that's that's transnational, transcultural, transracial, but it's oh, yeah. not based on the lowest common denominator. It's based upon the highest good. It's based upon mm. the fact that, that he came to restore the icon. He is yeah. actually, it says in Hebrew, the image of that's God. Right. And so that that is like the ultimate is Christ himself. So which brings me to the sort of the, the kind of the fundamental message of, of Christianity, which is um, St. Uh, Dorotheus of Gaza presented this uh, wheel like a spoke. And he said, Christ is in the middle of the hub. And all of these spokes are there. And if we will, wherever we find ourselves on these spokes, begin to travel towards Christ automatically, we're coming closer to one another. But the further we get away from Christ, we're getting further and further away from one another. And so mm. this, this message needs to be communicated to the world around us. Because wow. right now we're in the middle of everybody emphasizing those things that divide us rather than those things that unite us. And mm. some people are trying to unite around uh, like that which isn't humanity. In other words, just mm -hmm. like around technology or something like that, or, or money or these things that ultimately will divide. But if we think about what Jesus really has, has for us here, he came to a people in, of color and it was for the whole world. And um, so that's why when I think about is Christianity a white man's religion, let's take a look at it and see. And we have to realize it was for white people and it's for black people, and it's for brown people, and it's for Asian people. And when we stop and we think about this beauty of this tapestry, we have to realize, wow, that's what it's all about. He came yeah. to the to the the lowest spot in Jerusalem that was rejected, that, that was oppressed and downcast, where he was born, and you know, in Bethlehem, and then grew up in Nazareth, that even among the Jewish people was looked down on. But that's where this root emerged out of dry ground. So. Amen. Father. That'll preach. That'll it's, preach. <laughs> would, Father, would you say it's, it's a, it's a, a, a true statement, so a, a quick yes or no on this, cause then I'll follow up 
do you think it's a true statement to say to, to say that not enough of the American black community really knows about these roots in African Christianity and therefore the link to orthodoxy? I do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a true statement. Okay. And yeah. and so what what significance then would the black community in America discovering this, um, what, what significance would that have? It's hard to say. I, th I think um, there has to be real prayer, fasting, and healing done by um, the those that are from European or Eastern European backgrounds for that to really be effective. Because, I mean, one, one time Father Moses, when he before he was Orthodox, he went into this church and he saw in there uh, a black icon of Cyprian of Carthage. And so at first his thought was, oh, what's this guy trying to do? Just trying to like reach out to people in the neighborhood thinking that if he has a, has a uh, black icon that it's going to do the trick, you know? And so when he found out that he was actually venerating him as a saint and that he would, and that he looked like himself, it, it was this, big visceral experience that caused this thing yeah. to happen for him. And yeah. my wife, uh, she had quite a sense of humor. I mean, you know, she kept telling me, um, you better stop reading all those books. You're going to get confused. And, you know, what were those books, those Orthodox books, right? And so one day I said, well, just go with me to a liturgy. Just a session. all right, all right, I'll go with you. So she, we go and she's sitting in the middle of this service and it was the liturgy. And I'm thinking that and as a Protestant pastor at the time, oh, I remember reading about this. This is called the great entrance. And I'm thinking like that, you know, just in terms of like the, the book learning. And all of a sudden I feel her poke me in the ribs. She says, mm -hmm. I'm in heaven. I don't know about you. I'm becoming Orthodox. <laughs> Why? Amen. Why? Wow. When she saw the icon of Archangel Michael and Archangel Gabriel, she sensed the presence of the angels in the liturgy. Wow. She wow. sensed the fact that there was a communion of saints going on in the liturgy, and she knew this is for she me. Was home. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I looked at her and I was, I was thinking, what? You got it that fast? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was just still on the outside. Kind of Father, in your, in your thing. observations of, of the Black church, um, where are there intersections between the black, uh, um, the black American church experience and, and how we practice orthodoxy? Are there intersections that the black oh, yeah. community could relate, uh, relate to? Definitely. Um, I'll tell you a few. The, the theme, Al, Al Rabato, who, who was, uh, he's reposed, God rest his soul. Um, he was a Princeton professor. He wrote a book called Slave Religion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he wrote about in that book was this idea of the joyful sorrow oh. or the sorrowful joy. And somehow in the midst of the suffering, grace of God touching people's hearts. Well, that's a theme that's, that's uh, very um, powerful in orthodoxy but it's also a theme that's very uh, powerful in the, the history of Africans, especially since slavery. But what I did in that book, Wade in the River, was I actually talked about this, um, it's probably half of that book, is on what are called slave martyrs and confessors. And this was the fact that Father Damascene Christensen had, had who was is the current abbot in St. Herman's Monastery in Platina, he did a, a tremendous study on the number of early martyrs that were never able to be baptized Orthodox because they were had to be baptized in their blood. And so mm -hmm. he was pointing out that in the American experience, there were a lot of these that had were true Christians that some of them had actually been killed for praying for their masters. And so he was he asserting that there is a, they shouldn't be 
uh, in the Orthodox calendar per se, but they should sure be recognized and honored as sanctifying American soil by their suffering. And then there was a second category of confessors, and those are those that had suffered for their faith, even though they weren't killed. And there's a whole lot of those. And then there's a third group called passion bearers who suffered for Christ because of righteousness. And so you start to think about this. And I mean, it's like that that theme that's come up from the African-American experience needs to be acknowledged and recognized, I think, by Orthodox people as, as a very important thing to make. But now let's mm -hmm. talk about the actual experience within um, the Black community. Keep in mind that just like white Christians, there's all these variations in practice and culture. Um, everything from Roman Catholic to Anglican to Episcopal to you know all of these variations and Methodist and Baptist and non-denominational, that's all part of that experience. But there were, during that time of slavery, the hidden, what they called brush arbors or hush harbors, where they had secret uh, prayer meetings that was very much like catacomb Christianity. And um, I mentioned earlier about the idea of a triple immersion baptism. That was part of the experience. Another thing that's when, when you see in the Orthodox liturgy, the call and response with the prokimenon, let's say during um, Vespers, well, that, that there's, there's a whole piece of that that's very much a part of what they call devotions within within Baptist churches, and um, I uh, I used to listen to those a lot and, and loved to participate in them because it would be a way of touching something very deep where the deacon would let out the call and the whole congregation would rise to the occasion. I mean, if you look at the actual reality of what's happening, that's really what we have within. Um, the the experience uh the other thing that i would say was the um the, the whole there's a sacramental part that that's um that's very much a part of um uh, uh, a number of the the churches but uh it's it's misunderstood by some to, to not realize its fullness like baptism and communion are oftentimes just referred to as ordinances but they, if you start to explain about the what the reality of what we call mysteries in the Orthodox Church, there's an easy way to bring all of that together. Um, the other, the other emphasis that's there. Um, many times, there's this emphasis upon helping the poor, that that had been um, just a normal part of of. African American culture that a lot of times had been um, lost within the um, expression of Christianity, not from its origins, but because of the way that it had been practiced in the West, where people began to let go of some of that. But a lot of that's being recovered, and so um, uh, I would say the the other the other things that's happening right now that's very interesting is. Um, Music is being looked at again in a way that can be uh, recognizing that it, it, it bridges gaps. Mm -hmm. Mother Catherine Weston had just finished a liturgy uh, that was based upon spirituals. Mother Catherine's a black abbess in Indianapolis, and uh, I think that's the beginning of it. Dr. Carla um, Thomas in Anniston, Alabama, had um, they're they're taking some of the things that she's written and beginning to do some things with it. Um, there's there's so much to explore in this area that I think is going to, if it's just done sort of like from the head, it won't work. You can't have people trying to mimic something. It has to be real. It has to come from the heart and from within. But if you look at the some of the videos that have come out of Kenya in terms of how they approach Holy Communion. Um, there's clapping, there's, there's dancing on the way to receive 
the blessing of the bishop at the end of the liturgy mm -hmm. from the Orthodox Kenyans that are there. If There's you drums. Look, yeah. Drums, yeah. If There's you drums. look at the experience of theophany in Ethiopia, there's uh, the dancing of the priests over the blessing of the waters. And so I'm, I'm saying that I think we need to like uh, step back and let the Holy Spirit begin to truly um, bring about something that will enable people to um, discover the riches of both parts. So, Father, I want to, uh, and Luther, forgive me for a moment. I, I want to jump in and just, just mention something. F Father, uh, and, and this is kind of for our, our, our viewers to consider. Father mentioned a few minutes ago about the country, uh, the American country, um, America being sort of baptized by the blood of those who were slaves here and um, that we could consider them uh, Orthodox in the sense of, you know, being martyrs and things like that. There are people who are listening to Father say that and they're going to say, oh, they, but they weren't Orthodox and they weren't this and that. I want to remind our viewers of something. And we don't have the time to get into it right now, what, what Father said. I think it's it's worthy of its own conversation. But I re want to remind our viewers uh, who, who would you know have a conniption fit over that to remember one thing. If you've ever seen the, the icon of the Holy 40 Martyrs of Sebast, they were a, 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 a cohort of soldiers who were martyrs for the faith. It's a wonderful story. But I'm going to remind you of one thing. If you look at that icon you'll count 40 men in the lake. And if you look off to the side, there's a little building and there's the, the image of, of a man walking into that building. Now, what does that mean? Uh, in the story, he was one of the 40 sent into the lake to die by the pagan Romans who re were requiring those 40 who were Christians to burn incense to the emperor. They refused to do it. They sent them into the lake in, in, in the middle of winter. And as they were freezing and dying and so forth, that one guy, that one baptized Christian, walked out and, and went and burned the incense to get warm and to get, hung, uh, to get fed. As they were dying, singing hymns, supporting one another and so forth, one of the pagan soldiers saw what was happening, saw their love for one another, saw their hymns, heard their hymns, to God and so forth, and at the very toward the very end, threw off his his uh, soldiering uh, cloaks and, and and all of that kind of stuff, and he ran into the lake confessing Christ because he heard them do it. He died a martyr, and he was not baptized, and yet we confess him as one of the holy forty martyrs. That's Amen. worth considering. Amen. Anybody gets upset about what Father. <laughs> But, oh, my God, they weren't Orthodox. Well, either a lot of the other martyrs in our church who were never baptized in water, but were baptized in blood for confessing Christ. That's, That's just right. worth considering. Unfortunately, that, that point um, really is worth much more development. Yeah. And, and there's a book called Unbroken Circle. Circle, yeah. That um, we published out of the fellowship oh there you go fellowship of saint moses father damascene's article in there is very good and it's specifically to that point and then mm -hmm. the other we th there's a lot of that that's expressed in the in the book wade in the river so mm -hmm. that's good that's good i know time is approaching us i got one quick question just a uh, super sure. quick um so um we have some some Protestant friends that are reading some of these African early church fathers, you know, St. Athanasius, you know, St. Augustine, um, you know, you name it, you know, St. Cyprian of Carthage and so on and so forth. Any advice, wisdom, insight for them? I know in the past I used to see like even a lot of Protestant apologists reference some of them, you know, as right. if, you know, there was a, a sense of continuity, but for anybody else that's looking into that, any any insight for them? Um, I would I would suggest. I mean, if you, if you look at the, even if you copied for them sections from Wade in the River, on Saint Athanasius, on Saint Cyprian, on um, Saint Curiel, I think that would be helpful. 
Um, the other thing that I would I would say is to remember that well, there's a problem today, and and that is that you know there's a lot of people that are thinking because they read something that they understand it, and mm. I um, I'll never when I was reading about orthodoxy, I was kept thinking, oh, I could fit this into our Protestant worship service. Oh, I could do this this way and that way. And there came a particular point of crisis when I realized the Lord was calling me to become Orthodox. And so it was like, um, that's not that you would, you would um, convince anybody or force anybody or debate anybody, but there is something about orthodoxy that's a treasure. And after I, that happened, my experience was like, I felt like I was a little kid that had just discovered a cave full of buried treasure. And, mm. and I realized that before what I had was very good, but I, I realized that it's, it's as one priest explained when we first became Orthodox, it was like I had a quarter of a glass but now I had the fullness and I didn't realize there was so much that was available to us through orthodoxy. That was like our quiver was full in terms of spiritual warfare and in terms of um, living mm. this truth. And so um, there is a saying, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's, it's a common saying in the black church, which it's better caught than taught. There's something of that's an indescribable quality about orthodoxy that my wife picked up on the very first liturgy that she went to. She said, I'm in heaven. I don't know about you, I'm becoming orthodox. She had had a seventh grade education. She, she learned because she had to take care of her brothers and sisters after that, but she read a lot. But I mean, her acquisition of this was not because first and foremost, because of reading, it was first and foremost because it was this grace of the Holy Spirit that was drawing her. And so I would encourage people to pray and say, Lord, what is this about this ancient church? Is there really some kind of connection to it in these modern times? If so, show me. And the faithful spirit that guides us into all the truth will be faithful to them to answer their prayer. Amen. Whoa. Amen. 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 Yeah. Well said. Well said. Well, Father, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you coming through and blessing us with so much your, your wealth of knowledge. Uh, so I would really I'd ask you all to be praying for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Three weeks ago, before Father Moses passed, he mm -hmm. said, you've got to finish that book. What was the mm -hmm. book? It was the life of my wife, Marishka Mikaela. And on the day that he passed, I finished the rough draft. And so now I'm doing, we're doing the final touches. And there's this, um, you ask Father Jonathan about connections and things like that. That's in large part what a lot of this book is about because she lived it, she experienced it. And so from her, her life, that's gonna be very helpful. So, I mean, I'll just give you one example. <laughs> um, one time she was riding in the back seat and a bishop was in the front seat. So she looked at the mitre, you know, the bishop's hat. And so she says, Ooh, I like this hat. And so um, the, it was explained to her that that was not like a, a crown of um, like we would think of on an earthly king, but it was looked like that because we were giving honor to the crown of thorns. And that's why it looked like that, so that it would be honoring the fact that the bishop was to wear the crown of thorns. And that's why he wore that hat. And another time, this this bishop explained to her, um, she, she, you know, in, in the Orthodox Church, they'll go up to a bishop and they'll say, Master, bless. And of course, she said, I'm not asking no man to, to be <laughs> Master, <laughs> bless. No, I'm not a master. <laughs> <laughs> and so... He explained, he explained, I totally agree with you if that's what this was going to be about. But he said, you know, like in Star Wars, they had, um, you know, Master Yoda, who was like a teacher. And then the others were like learning from him. 
that's what it is about. It's not master like slave and master. It's like master like m- m- master and disciple or master and student. And so you're asking the teacher to give you a blessing. And I thought, Amen. oh, that's a good way to look at it. And of course, she said, but we still have to explain that to people. Otherwise, they're going to misunderstand it. So right, right. these are things that have to be broken down and explained. But pray for me mm-hmm. that I can finish this book and that it can come out soon. Amen. Yeah. Well, Father, thank you again. And, and tell everybody where your monastery is. We're in Weatherby, Missouri. It's a thriving metropolis of 117 people. And uh, we're an hour north of Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. And um, we, we live in 80 acres and there's there's six nuns and four brothers that are and there's a, a dachshund and a border collie blue healer and a bunch of chickens and so surrounded by deer and woods and and come visit us so given your location I take it you're rooting for the 49ers uh, in the Super Bowl we pr- we always pray for our enemies <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant, Father. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Luther. Good to see you, brother. We're going to be talking soon. Father, God bless you. God bless the monastery. Our Thanks regards so and love to the, the to the, the monks and nuns there. And um, uh, may your efforts and your work in the vineyard be blessed. Um, and may many people come to the blessedness of the kingdom through your ministries. Thank you all. Luther, Father Jonathan, great to be with you. And may your work be blessed. Amen. Amen to all. Good night, everybody.